Microphones working? Sounds like they probably are. All right, so first of all, I really appreciate everybody coming out today. It's, it's really an honor to be with a group like you all, folks who are coming out. I know some of you are in academia, some of you are in industry, and, and have a lot of producers here as well. So it really is great to be out and, and talk to folks and, and learn from everybody. But what I would like to do today is just talk a little bit about our operation, uh, Old Home Place Farm. Before I jump into it, I would like to say this is very much a family farming operation. Uh, my dad, while I'm up here kind of in the in the spotlight and walking around talking, my dad, Ronnie, has been here for the last couple of days, and he's uh, certainly the brains behind the operation and, uh, <laughs> and uh, does quite a bit, uh, does quite a bit. So we'd be happy to talk to you about what we do later if you would like. But just to kind of give you a little bit of context, I'm sure that most of you are pretty familiar with the state of Kentucky, but our little slice of heaven is down here in the southeastern part of the state. If you know anything about Kentucky geology and geography, you know that as you start out in the west and go to the east, it's a pretty big transition, pretty large change. We can start out in far west Kentucky and be in a big river system and be in cypress swamps take off, start driving east, and once you uh, get in about this area over here, we're in the Appalachian Mountains. So that's where we're at, that's where our farm is. We're very much a, a mountain farm. And this is kind of a picture, a little bit blown out it looks like. This is a picture of a uh, part of the farm. Just to give you a little bit of context, this is a multi-generation farm. It's been in the family, in my mom's side of the family, since about the Civil War. So it's been in the family for quite a few generations. Now that said, I didn't grow up on the farm. Uh, my parents had a business. They were selling a business along in uh, about 2004, if I recall correctly. And about that same time, my mom's cousin had bought a business and was looking to sell the farm. So it worked out pretty well. Uh, my cousin sold the, sold the operation to my parents and we moved on to the farm. No, we had grown up, uh, I grew up very rural lifestyle. I mean, we'd always lived there in southeast Kentucky, but uh, we'd never done any commercial farming before. I mean, we'd always raised a big garden, had a few chickens, even kept some milk goats from time to time, but we'd never done anything like this. So it was a lot of opportunities to learn, right? I mean, you get some cows, stick them out on a pasture, and that's all that there is to it, right? wrong. <laughs> so we did learn. It was a lot of opportunities to learn and, and we had a lot of really good resources to do that over the years. So we did have some great folks locally. I mean there were there were and are some really good producers around close by that we know and uh, we were able to get some great tips some great mentorship from them. But also some of the resources from University of Kentucky and Virginia Tech uh, with their their uh, steep farm pasture uh, work, and and from a lot of other sources as well, doing pasture walks, all the printed materials out there, and just bringing all these things back to the farm, trying them out one at a time, seeing what sticks for our operation, what makes sense, and what actually works for where we're at. Over time, uh, we did end up expanding the operation by a little bit. We started out, as I mentioned, with my parents' farm. Uh, and that's actually an aerial shot of it over here. My wife and I purchased another farm a few miles up the river from that uh, several years ago, 2014. And we manage all the livestock, all the pasture is one operation. So they're a little bit of distance between them, but we are very much managing the livestock side of this as one operation. So we have about 90 acres of pasture between the two operations, between the two farms. And of that 90 acres, about 40 acres of it is good, rich river bottom ground. I mean, good ground. I mean, class one farm ground. The other 50 acres, well, not, not so much class one farm ground, but it's what we have to work with. In terms of the infrastructure and everything, we have over the years transitioned almost everything on both farms to high tensile electric fence. We're huge, huge uh, uh, supporters of that system. It works really well for 
for our system right now. And, uh, and that's kind of how we've been operating. So, and one of the things that we have done that we became really apparent to us a few years in is that even though we had 90 acres, part of which were really good river bottoms, that's still not a lot of pasture when you're thinking about a cow-calf operation. So we've added in some additional species over time, and we've also kind of transitioned our marketing model. So we start out just strictly cow-calf, added in some other species, but we have also branded our product, and we have started taking some animals in, having them processed, uh, using using our label, using the Kentucky Proud and Appalachia Proud label, using those great resources that we have from the Department of Agriculture. But now we have an online farm store where we're selling grass-fed beef and lamb and making weekly deliveries to about five a five-county area around. The majority of our product going to individual customers, uh, some of it also going to restaurants and event spaces as well. So. That's kind of where we're at today on the marketing side of things. I've talked to you a little bit about where our operation is and real quick about bringing you up to speed on how we got to be where we are today. But when my dad and I were talking about this, we thought that it might make sense to break things up into a couple of other buckets to talk about. So being, looking at one way a challenge that we face, or looking at it from another angle, the opportunities that we have with the ground that we have and that we're farming right now. So for our specific uh, piece of ground that we're working, that's the steep terrain. We are in East Kentucky after all. Extending the grazing season, which I know has been a, a lot of talk about that here today, and then also producing high quality forages so we can put the gains reliable gains on those animals before we take them into the processor. So I would like to touch on each of these just briefly, just for a couple minutes, and talk about how we've approached it. Not necessarily saying it's the best, but it's what works out for us today right now. So in terms of the steep terrain, this is a shot of my parents' farm. It's a grown shot. To tell you the truth, that does not do justice to the hillside there. Uh, that always says in East Kentucky we have a lot of flat level ground. It just all happens to be turned up on its edge. And that, that pretty much is the case with our property. And I mean, that, there's a couple things to be aware of with, with that sort of system. These slopes are so steep that you can't get equipment on them reliably. You certainly can't go in and do a full pasture conversion or renovation to something else. We have fertility issues potentially, on the sides of the mountains, all these things, but that's what we have to work with, and we have found some ways to address some of these issues. One of the big things that we were seeing early on, uh, I uh, heard the gentleman from Gallagher today mention something about blackberries taking over a place. Trust me, we know about blackberries and multiflora rows and ironweed all those things that pop up that when they're on the side of a mountain where you can't get a piece of equipment to them, it's an even bigger issue than it might have been otherwise. That being the case, we looked around and we found some tools that work pretty good for that. In our case, it's small ruminants. So we brought in goats back in uh, 2006, if I recall correctly, and you see the goat there. She actually has her face stuck into, a, I think that's a multiflora rose it looks like. That was the entire reason we brought goats onto the farm, or one of the bigger reasons, and then added sheep a few years later, just as an additional resource, find something else to use those forages, that when we were looking at them, I mean, it's, it's one thing to look at them and say, this is a problem. We've got blackberries, we've got ironweed, we've got other things that the cows don't necessarily want to eat, but if you find something to eat them, if you find something to utilize that forage, it's not a problem anymore. It's no longer a challenge, it's now a resource. So at the end of the year, instead of spending money on fuel and or actually spending time walking up and down the side of a bank with a backpack sprayer and a grubbing hole, trying to knock down blackberries and to just keep them from taking a place, you're able to bring the animals in and then sell those weeds at the end of the year. The small ruminants also work great on the side of a mountain 
again, it's tough for a cow sometimes to get around in some of these places. They can do it, but it's not the most comfortable thing for them. But this is the kind of territory that's made for sheep and goats. So again, that's uh, one of the things that we've done to kind of tackle the, the steep slopes that we have. Extending the grazing season, we were just talking today about, uh, or a few minutes ago, about summer stockpile. We have been doing some of that. And also doing a couple other things. Uh, in case you are wondering, that is pigs in the foreground there. I realize that pigs aren't ruminants, but nobody told pigs they couldn't eat grass, so they, they do take a bite of it every now and then. But we do have a big focus on trying to extend our grazing season. We would rather the animals go out and harvest their own forage rather than us cut hay or buy hay and bring in to them. So that's a, a big part of the operation is figuring out how we do that. We do use a lot of stockpile, both in the winter time, do use some in the summer. We, I mentioned that we have a lot of high tensile fence up. We have probably 20 to 25 permanent paddocks across the two farms, depending on whether you're a lumper or a splitter, depending on what you call a one paddock versus two paddocks. But using, using reels and poly wire and poly tape, we essentially have an infinite number of paddocks. So that's what we do. We are using rotational grazing across the entire farm. We match, we try to match what the forage is to what we're bringing the animals in there. So instead of saying we're going to give them a quarter acre today or a half acre, we see how much we have out there, which class of animals we're bringing in, and then match it to them. So it's, it's kind of a patchwork at any given time. That's really how we're trying to extend those resources out through that management. I also like this picture uh, up here because it does demonstrate that I actually work sometimes instead of just talking about working. So I do like the documentation of that and would like for all of you all to vouch for that when Dad says otherwise. <laughs> One other thing that we have done, uh, this is my wife Maggie. You see, if you can see above her head, this is native warm season grasses. We started a few years ago to transition some of our pastures into additional forages. Native warm seasons, it's been a big blue, a big blue stem in the Indian grass field with the idea that we are extending the grazing by having that good forage out there in the middle of the summer. It takes some pressure off of our cold season pastures because we, up until this, we're like, like most every other operation in our part of the world, it was predominantly tall fescue across the entire operation, all, all perennial cool seasons. So adding in these perennial warm season grasses has really been a benefit to us. We've only been grazing them for a couple years now. Uh, obviously this is one, in one of the establishment years before we started grazing, otherwise it wouldn't have been quite that big. But, uh, but it's really filled that gap. It's filled a hole in and allowed us to start moving out and taking better advantage of, of the land base. And then just moving into the high quality forages, that was the second reason that we wanted to include the native warm seasons on the pasture. So I mentioned already that we thought that they would play a critical role in going out there and providing biomass, which you do. I mean, it's, Ridiculous. Those of you I know, I've already talked to several folks who have some. It's a ridiculous amount of forage and biomass they can produce in that three month summertime period. And it's also just a great forage. I mean, it really puts the weight on the animals, uh, particularly the cattle, is mostly what we're running through it. I mean, it's a, a lot of grass at a time when our cool seasons aren't growing. But it's also a really high quality forage that really allows us to know that we can finishing an animal, we can put enough weight on a certain class, certain size class of animal to be able to take it to processing size during the time of the year when it would otherwise be pretty much impossible for us to do that. I've rambled on for a few minutes now and I'm going to close in just a second, but I guess just to tie everything together, one thing that I would like to note is it as much as we've learned over the years? And I mean, when we started doing it, we we had a lot to learn, obviously, and we still have a lot to learn. There's not a year goes by that we don't learn something else about it. Now, I mean, when we first started, or certainly when I first started thinking about this, I was probably more focused on 
on the cattle and thinking about the animal versus the forages. But what I've come to realize over the last several years is it's really about the forages. And we certainly still have to think about the cattle. We have to have to take into account all those other things, all the other livestock and, and the individual animal performance. We have to take all that into account. But at the end of the day, it really is about managing that forage base. We have at our disposal out there a giant green solar collector, and it's up to us to figure out how to manage that the best that we can on our own individual operation. Oftentimes when people come to us, and again, we, we sell meat, our, our product, one of our primary products is meat, but when folks buy a T-bone steak or a package of lamb chops or a, a pound of burger, when they buy something to throw on the grill from us, they're getting meat. They're getting a, a good product they can put on the grill. But one thing that Dad and I have talked about often is that they're getting that meat, but that meat is really just a product of sunshine and raindrops. I mean, it's just concentrated forage. It's managing our forages. It's managing the sunshine and the raindrops to grow those forages and then turn that into meat. So that's how we've done it on our operation. Can't say that, uh, can't say that we'll be doing it this way five years from now. I imagine there will be tweaks, but that's how we're doing it today. And with that, uh, really appreciate you all coming out today. And if there are any questions, I think we might have just a few minutes. Yes, sir. Yeah, the warm season grass establishment is interesting. Uh, we, uh, we put them in at a time it worked. So first of all, let me say, obviously, we, we got them established. The first bunch that we put in, we put some more out this year, actually, but the first bunch that we put out, really wet year, we got a really, we got a great kill going in. We terminated everything with a, with a chemical, knocked it down, and then drilled into that. It was a really wet year, and we got a lot of broadleaf weed competition. That was 2016, if I recall correctly. It worked, uh, but Dad said that for him, he said it wasn't for the faint of heart. And... <laughs> And, uh, and that's probably the case. It, may, it was probably a little bit harder on Dad than it might have been other folks because it was right outside the front door. So every time he walked out of the house, he was looking at it. But it did take off. I mean, it took it a while, and we did have to go back in and, and redo part of one field, a little bit lower line area. Again, we, for us, we put, we chose to put these, uh, our native warm seasons in a, in a river bottom, pretty rich area. So, Certainly not swampy, but, but pretty rich ground. There was a fair amount of competition. It worked. We had to replant a little bit of that just to get the, get the stand density up where we wanted it. But, but it's worked well enough that we have planted about an additional four acres uh, this year on a different area that we'll probably be using for uh, probably hay. It's not directly, directly attached to pasture. And we might end up transitioning some on uh, on the other farm as well. I mean, that's one thing that we're not afraid to try and to learn. One of the things that we have done in addition to the native warm seasons, I mean, we're right in the middle of transitioning part of part of my farm right now to novel end of fight fescue. So we're continually trying different things and, and uh, hopefully the novel end of fight fescue, I think it'll probably not be quite as nerve wracking. It'll at least be faster. So, so we'll know sooner whether or not it works, I guess. But, uh, yep. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the native warm seasons and grazing them, all right, so the native warm season grasses and how many times did we uh, actually graze them and did we only graze them with cattle? We ran the, ran the sheep in through there some. They might have used it a little bit, but they were honestly going, I mean, five years from now, who knows what they'll be doing, but they're a bunch of grass. The sheep were going largely, going around the bunches and eating. So there was clover and stuff like that coming up around the bunches, and that's mostly what they were focusing on. Uh, we were, I'm trying to think, we, 
I can't tell you exactly how many times we grazed through it, but what we did, I mean, we turned into it. We'd let it get up about waist high and then take it back down to about knee height. And by the time we would get to one end of the field with the number of animals that we had in there, we'd be able to rotate them back in to the where we'd started at. So in terms of how many times that was, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you, but, but that's kind of how we managed it. Yes, sir, Dr. Hendricks. Yeah, so the stockpile and the fescue, we, to be honest, we, so the question was the impact of the native warm season grasses and being able to stockpile fescue. It should really set us up for it. If we could ever get a get a year with a with a good amount of rain through the fall, we would see how that works. But we we feel that it should really set us up to do that. Again, we'll be able to focus that animal pressure on the native warm season grasses through the summertime when they're really thriving and take that pressure off of our cold season. So that is the uh, that is the goal. That's what we're aiming for. Last year was the first year that we were able to to really graze the native warm seasons. Uh, this year was the first year that they kind of truly started to come into their own. We felt like, and then we ran into a. Uh, we had all kinds of rain early on, and then it kind of shut off about July. So unfortunately, we did didn't have quite as much moisture as we'd like to stockpile fescue in the fall. But we're hoping if if it all works the way that we anticipate, it should set us up well for that. Right. Yeah, so the percentage of the pastures in warm season right now is a, a percentage of the farm and then how they perform in a dry time versus fescue. Uh, let's see, we have about, I think it's nine acres. So again, we've got about about 90 acres, so about 10% right now that's actually in in uh, the native warm seasons. In terms of what we saw in, uh, from production though, I mean, it's, it's great. Uh, again, it was, uh, it was really nice to have a grass that we knew that would be able to thrive even when the rain did quit, and it did for the latter half of the summer. It, it uh, shut off for right there where we were at anyway, and it just kept going, and uh, the, the cold seasons didn't. I mean, it was, it was kind of the off time of the year for them anyway, but from past experience, it's, it's uh, without a doubt, did tremendous, tremendously better than it would have if we'd been out there on cold seasons and, and praying for rain to come. Yes, sir. Yeah, so water to the livestock on the hillsides. We we let them come back down to the bottom to get it. So <laughs> we uh, we we have over the last several years uh, spent spent quite a bit of time putting water infrastructure, and we have pretty good water infrastructure across the farm now. And I mean, it's been uh, it's been good for us to learn that and see that on our own it's we've also had some help from nrcs and from other uh some other sources to get some of that done but it's great to have the water across the farm but we're not trying to get it up to them we're certainly let them come down to it the interesting thing so the the farm really does lie within a, a river valley so it's kind of long it's it's linear it's linear, so as long as we can get it stretched out along the, the long part of it, even if they're up on the top coming down, they're not going to have that far to walk to get back down to it. And uh, a lot easier for them to walk down than it is for us to figure out how to get it up there, I think. So. All right, thank you all very much. <laughs>